Next up is curvilinear motion. This is motion of particles in two or three dimensions. So now that we're moving in two or three dimensions, uh, we need a more expansive way of describing this motion in order to uh, work with kinematics. And for that, we need vector description. And for that, we need to choose, obviously, a coordinate system. And we'll begin with the Cartesian or rectangular coordinate system. or XYZ. <clears throat> now when we pick the coordinate system it's important that we stick to the right-hand rule convention. The right-hand rule convention tells us if we choose for example X to point this way and Y to point that way then we need to be consistent in the way that Z points relative to that. And the right-hand rule simply says if we use our right hand, the thumb, index, and middle finger of our right hand your thumb points along the x-axis, your index finger points along the y-axis, and your middle finger points along the z-axis. So the coordinate system is oriented like that relative to your right hand. Okay? So here's our Cartesian coordinate system and according to the right hand rule. And suppose we have a particle moving through this space. There's our particle P and maybe it's moving along following some path in three-dimensional space. And suppose that's the path that it's following. Then the position of particle P is the vector R. And R has its root at the origin of the coordinate system and it follows a line up to the particle like that. So there's the position vector R in three-dimensional space. Now, if we look at the position of that particle some short time later, suppose it's moved along the path and now it's here, let's call that position P prime, okay? And we'll call the position of that particle at P prime R prime. It's a new vector for this new position. And so the change in position between P and P prime, we can draw that vector as well, like this, we'll call that delta R. So that's the change in position over some interval. So position P prime is R prime after the interval. And suppose that interval time is, we'll just call it delta T. All right, so a particle is moved from position R to position R prime over time delta T. Now, just like we did with uh, rectilinear motion, in curvilinear motion, three-dimensional motion, we can find the instantaneous velocity. The instantaneous velocity. And again, it's a vector. V is equal to the limit as that time interval becomes very small, so delta t approaches zero of the change in the position, which we call delta r, divided by the time interval, delta t. And according to calculus, that's just equal to dr dt. So it's the derivative of a vector with respect to time. Now another important thing is average speed is a little bit different. The average speed over time, delta t, let me draw the path again. Let me exaggerate a little bit. Suppose this is the path. Here's our coordinate system. And here's the particle P, and here is P prime. Now, for the average speed, this is going to be equal to what we'll refer to as delta s over delta t, where delta s is the path length over that time interval, delta t. And the reason the path length this is important, it's not delta r, because as you recall, this vector would be delta r. And it's not that distance, it's the distance that the particle actually follows. For example, if it follows the blue curve, we have 
perhaps that's a length of you know, 20 meters or something. And if the particle followed a slightly different path, for example this one, over that same time interval, I think you appreciate that over the same time interval our particle would cover a significantly larger distance, delta s, path length, and therefore the average speed would be much larger. Larger. So average speed over some finite time interval, you need to consider the path length. But for the instantaneous velocity, it's just the derivative of the vector. Now, so that's the velocity. So let me draw our picture again. Here's the particle. Here's the path that it's following. Here's the position r. And so the velocity vector, in this case, will look like that. Um, one important thing about the velocity vector, and it is that this velocity vector is always tangent to the path that the particle is following. This is important because sometimes when we know something about the path a particle is following, for example, uh, moving in a circle, we know something about the path, then we know something about the tangential direction. So we have information about the direction of motion. So sometimes we can gather information about a velo the velocity of a particle from the path. Similarly, we can find the acceleration, instantaneous acceleration of a particle by the as the derivative of the velocity vector, which is equal to the second derivative of the position vector. And just to draw it in this picture, here's our acceleration vector. It is not necessarily tangent to the path. So now we're dealing with vectors as representations for our kinematics and our motion. So we need to uh, brush up a little bit on some vector notation and mathematics. Suppose we have a vector, and I'm going to talk arbitrarily, and I'll call it capital P, and it's a function of a scalar u. And again, this is an arbitrary representation, usually for us we will have something like r is the vector and the scalar function is time, so the position is a function of time, or the velocity as a function of time. So arbitrarily though, call it p as a function of the scalar u. Okay. And if this is our right hand coordinate system, and here's a path that our particle is following, and here is the vector p that's a function of u. So as u varies, the scalar varies, right? the particle is going to move along this path, this path, and the tip of the vector p is going to move as well. And, and the length of p is going to change. Now the derivative of the vector, we didn't go into explicitly, is defined as the limit as delta t uh, u, in this case, approaches zero of the vector at u plus delta u minus the vector at evaluated at u. All of this is divided by delta u. So that's technically speaking the limit that we're taking. And as we noted before, this vector is tangent to the path. So this is just repeating what we'd already seen, but for our arbitrary vector p which is a function of u. All right, now derivatives of vectors have some similar properties to scalars, but also some special cases. For example, the derivative with respect to the scalar u of vector p of u plus some other arbitrary vector we'll call q, which is also a function of u. All right. Well, that's just equal to the derivative of p. Now, if for f of u is a scalar function, so f is a scalar function of the scalar u, 
than the derivative of the product f times the vector p with respect to u is equal to df du times p plus f times dp du. So that's the chain rule, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, in vector operations, we also have two other operations. One is the dot product, and the other is the cross product. The derivative of the dot product of two vectors with respect to the scalar is equal to, it's just like the chain rule. So the result of the derivative of the dot product looks like that. An important thing about this is that the order matters. So it's db dot q, not the other way around. And similarly for the cross product, the derivative of the cross product of two vectors The result looks like that. And once again, for both of these operations, the order in which you take the dot or cross product matters. You can't change the order. Like you can with multiplying scalars, a times b is equal to b times a for scalars. Not necessarily the case for vectors. Now for vectors that are described in Cartesian or rectangular coordinates, the components are an important thing to be aware of. So our arbitrary vector p as a function of u can be expressed in terms of its components in each of the coordinate axes, that is x, y, and z. So this vector, that's our vector p, then it has a component in the x dimension, which we will call p sub x. So that is the component of the vector p in the, direction, in the x direction, and that is a scalar itself. And that, again, is a function of u as well, times i, which is the unit vector in the x direction. More on that in a moment. Plus the component of p in the y direction, times j, the unit vector, plus the component of p in the z direction, So i, j, and k are unit vectors with the little hat on them to indicate unit vector. Unit vectors in the directions x, y, and z. So i points in the x direction, j points in the y direction, and k points in the z direction. So those three always point in their respective directions, and the magnitude of i, that is its length, is always equal to 1, as is the magnitude of j and the magnitude of k. So these bars around a vector like that means the magnitude, the length. Okay. So those are the unit vectors in the Cartesian coordinate system. And again, p of x, p sub y, p sub z are scalar components in those directions. So now we can write our derivative in terms of those scalar components. So the derivative of p with respect to u now is equal to the derivative of p sub x with respect to u pointing in the x direction plus the derivative of the y component with respect to u that points in the j direction and plus the derivative in the z component with respect to u pointing in the k direction. We can write this another way, well, if the scalar, if the vector happens to be a function of time, <clears throat> then we have some uh, separate notation for the derivative. So the derivative of something with respect to time, of course that again is going to be dpx <clears throat> dt in the i direction. So that's the derivative of the components with respect to time. We write this another way. The derivative of something with respect to time, we, use, we will use shorthand notation of just putting a dot over the top. So p dot means the derivative of p with respect to time. <clears throat> 
So we can write this derivative as px dot times i. Just another way of writing and representing derivatives with respect to time. WRT with respect to. So now we're dealing with vector representations of motion and in particular uh, representations in Cartesian or rectangular coordinate system. So let's have a look at the components of vectors, in particular position, velocity, and acceleration vectors in these rectangular coordinate systems. So once again, the position of a particle the position of a particle is described by the vector r and r may be a function of time, has components rx in the x direction plus ry in the y direction plus rz in the z direction. Now we don't usually use r sub x and r sub y and r sub z to represent this. We use x and y and z to represent the components of the position in the rectangular or Cartesian coordinate system. And remember that uh, these i, j, and k are unit vectors, always have a length of 1, and always point in the same direction as x, y, and z, respectively. Um, to try to give you a three-dimensional perspective, of this vector and its components. Let me see if I can draw a projection. So this cube or rectangle that I've drawn is a three-dimensional representation where one corner of the rectangle is at the origin of the chord system. The opposite corner of the shape is at the tip of the vector. <clears throat> and so the component in the x-direction for that vector it looks like that x and similarly y. Now the velocity as we saw v is equal to the derivative of the position vector with respect to time and so that's going to be the derivative of x with respect to time times i so that's the derivative of the position vector. Remember that we also use a dot to represent a derivative with respect to time, so we could also write this, these components as x dot i plus y dot j plus z dot times k. And there's one other way that we can write the components of the velocity vector, and that is v sub x times i, that is the x component of the velocity vector, yj and vzk. So you'll see x dot y dot z dot a lot in this course or vx vy vz in this course you won't see dx dt very much at all. And so I can also add the velocity vector to that picture v. Similarly, we can write the acceleration vector, remember that's dv dt, or the second derivative of r with respect to time, and that is, can be written as x double dot times i, so two dots means two derivatives with respect to time of the position, plus y double dot j plus z double dot k or you might see it written as a sub x. So two different ways to write the components of acceleration, two different ways to write the components of the velocity vector. Really only one way to write the components of the position vector. Let's look at a special case of motion in three dimension and that's called projectile motion or ballistic motion. This is motion of a particle in a gravitational field. For example, throwing a ball in the air, shooting a basketball at a hoop, a bullet coming out of a gun, or even water coming out of a hose. Uh, 
And this is going to highlight one of the big uh, advantages of the component system, especially the rectangular component system. Recognize that the component system, Cartesian co component system, X, Y, Z, each of the components, directions, X, Y, and Z, are perpendicular to each other and therefore independent of each other. What's nice about this representation or using these independent coordinate systems is that we can split the problem up into the components and deal with them separately because they're independent and then put them back together in the end. So what I mean by that is, for example, if we throw a ball through the air, we can solve the problem for the motion in the y direction all on its own, the pr problem for motion in the x direction all on its own independently, and z as well, and then once we've solved all of those motions, put it back together to get the, to get the full vector representation. So for projectile motion or motion in a gravitational field, we have some information about that motion. For example, we know if we assume that um, y is the up direction, in our gravitational field description. So y is pointed up, x and z are the horizontal plane. Then we know that the acceleration in the x direction, so the component of acceleration in the horizontal direction, right? We could also call it x double dot. That's going to be equal to zero. There's no acceleration in the horizontal direction for a ball flying through the air if there are no forces acting on it. The acceleration in the y direction, we can also call it y double dot. Now this one's not zero. This is uh, acceleration due to gravity. So we can say that that acceleration is minus g. Okay, uh, just g is equal to 32.2 feet per second squared or in metric system 9.81 meters per second squared. Acceleration due to gravity. Okay. Uh, back to this and now we also know that the acceleration in the z direction can also write a z double dot is equal to zero. Right, so move a, a ball, a particle moving in a gravitational field, we know this about the acceleration. Uh, now what we can do is, if we're given, I see, initial condition information for all three component directions, so x at time equal to zero is x naught, y at time equal to zero is y naught. We know the initial position in all three coordinates. And we know the initial velocity. A little bit of notation here. So this is, says the velocity of x, the x component of the velocity at time equal zero is going to be equal to, we read this vx naught, so it's the component of an x initially, right, similarly for y and z. So we know all of the initial condition information about the motion of this particle at time equals zero. Well, what we can do is we can deal with each component separately, solving for the motion. So let me rewrite. We know that the acceleration in x is equal to zero. That means we have uniform motion. And in the case of uniform motion, we have a set of equations. We know that since the, the acceleration is zero, we also know that vx is equal to a constant. Right? And that constant is vx naught. So the velocity in a horizontal direction doesn't change. And we know, furthermore, that the position x is going to be equal to x naught plus vx naught t. So given the initial position and velocity in the x direction and the time over which things happen, we can figure out the final position for a ball flying through the air. In the y direction, we have an acceleration of minus g, a constant acceleration, so that is uniformly accelerated. We can do the integration as we did in the past, and from that we know that the velocity in the y direction will be equal to the velocity in the y direction initially, uh, excuse me, that's a minus, minus g times t.
So that equation will tell us how the velocity evolves. And the position in the y direction, y, is equal to the initial position plus initial velocity times time minus one-half GET squared. So those two equations tell us everything we need to know about the evolution of motion in the y direction. And then finally in the z direction, again we have uniform motion since the acceleration is equal to zero. The velocity in the z direction is constant and equal to the initial velocity. And the position evolves according to that equation. So, if I tell you all of the initial conditions about the motion of a particle in a gravitational field, like a ball that you throw, and I tell you the time over which it evolves, maybe five seconds or whatever, you can from that tell me what the final position will be of the particle. We also like to describe the relative motion of particles sometimes. Suppose we have two particles moving in a Cartesian reference frame. And one of them we'll call particle A. And the second we'll call particle B. Now we know that the pos we can describe the position of each. The position of A we'll call R sub A. And the position of B we'll call R sub B. Now let's create a second reference frame Let's create a second reference frame that's attached to particle A. Okay, it moves with particle A. And this second frame, it moves with particle A, but it doesn't rotate with respect to uh, reference frame XYZ. So it maintains its orientation, but travels with particle A. So I can draw that on here. There's X prime. Y prime and Z prime. So X prime is always parallel to X, Y prime to Y, and Z prime to Z, but it may travel through space with particle A. Now we can define the relative position, or the position of B, relative to A. And we write it this way, the position of B relative to A, so R sub B slash A, you read that position of B relative to A, is defined as R sub B minus R sub A. We could write this another way, just rearranging the vectors. The position of B is going to be equal to the position of A plus R B slash A. So this is the position of particle B relative to particle A. Now since we have a reference frame attached to A, we can also interpret this vector as being the position of particle B in the reference frame attached to A. And I can draw that vector on our graph like this. That's the position of B slash A. So R sub B and R sub A are position vectors in the absolute reference frame, that is the original XYZ, which we can indicate is motionless or fixed with uh, that kind of a symbol. So if this is our relative position, then we can also find the relative velocity just by taking the derivative. The velocity of B relative to A is just equal to VB minus VA, and likewise the acceleration. So we can think of this two ways. One, this is simply a definition of position of B relative to A. Right? Or we can think of this vector and the velocity and acceleration as the position of B 
in a reference frame attached to A. So for example, if you were riding in a car in A, I was riding in a car in B, it would appear to you sitting in car A that I was at position R, B slash A. That would be my position velocity and acceleration relative to you. As was pointed out earlier, the velocity of a particle, here's a particle moving along a curve, the velocity is always tangent to the path. What this leads us to is a new set of components that are convenient for us to use at times. That and These components are described relative to the path that the particle is following. And we call these tangential and normal components. These are components in the same way that X, Y, and Z are components in a Cartesian coordinate system. This is a new coordinate system written or described relative to the path of the particle. So just like with X, Y, and Z, we had to describe unit vectors, I, J, and K. These are vectors of length of one that point in the, the direction of interest. So for tangential and normal components, we define two new unit vectors. And we call these E sub n, that's the normal component, and E sub t, the tangential component. All right. Now, the tangential component, E sub t, always points in the same direction as the velocity. It always points in the same direction as velocity, therefore it's tangent to the path. And the normal direction, E sub n, is perpendicular to the tangential direction unit vector and points towards the center of curvature. Of the path, again relative to the path. So we can draw those two unit vectors on this graph since the tangential unit vector points in the same direction as velocity, tangent to the path, there is E sub t, our unit vector. E sub n, the normal unit vector, is perpendicular to that and towards the center of curvature. So here's the curvature of the path. So E sub n, the normal direction in this graph looks like that. And these two are perpendicular to each other. Now, with these unit vectors in mind, we can write, for example, the velocity, which in Cartesian coordinates we would break into components x times i, y times j, z times k, but we can break it into components in the normal and tangential coordinate system as follows. Note that the component of the velocity in the normal direction is always zero. It's always perpendicular to that. All of the velocity always points in the tangential direction. So this is simply equal to v, the length of the velocity vector, times unit vector e sub t. And so that's a straightforward representation of the velocity in this normal and tangential component system. Now the acceleration vector is equal to, of course, dv dt. All right, so that is equal to d dt of v e sub t in the normal and tangential component system. And by the chain rule, this derivative is equal to dv dt times e sub t plus v dE dt. Now, so dv dt, we can find that, it's not a problem. E sub t, we know what that is. It's the unit vector in the direction, in the tangential direction. V, we're okay with that. But what is this derivative of the unit, ve unit vector with respect to time? Well, in this case, backing up one slide, so as our particle moves along the path, 
I think you can see that our component normal tangential component system, it's not going to be fixed. It's going to change orientation. So if the direction, now we know the length of this doesn't change, but its direction is changing. So the, the derivative of this with respect to time is not going to be zero. And it's not zero because its orientation is changing. Now, without going through the demonstration, you can see the proof of this in the book if you want, but it's not that hard to prove that the derivative of e sub t with respect to time is equal to v over rho times e sub n. Now what are these things? Well, v is the speed. We know that rho is called the radius of curvature. It's a quantity that tells you how sharp the turn is. So, for example, a path like this has a very small radius of curvature. It's a sharp turn. And a path like this has a very large radius of curvature. Okay, It's a shallow turn. So, using making use of that, that means that the acceleration now, written in terms of normal and tangential components, is equal to dv dt in the tangential direction plus v squared over rho in the normal direction. So um, this is a little bit vague or unclear right now, but there are a few things you can surmise from this. For example, the tangential component of the acceleration, right? It's equal to dv dt. This relates quite directly to changes in speed. So the tangential component of acceleration is equal to the change in speed. If the speed is not changing, if something's moving with a constant speed, then this is going to be zero. The normal component is equal to v squared over rho. This is entirely related to changes in direction of travel. So if the direction in which a particle is traveling doesn't change, in other words, it's traveling in a straight line, this acceleration is going to be zero. One important thing about tangential and normal and components, if you encounter a problem where a particle is moving, or anything is moving in a circle, you're going to want to come look at tangential components, particularly for acceleration information. And because if it's moving in a circle, you know the radius of curvature. It's the radius of the circle itself. And so you can find at least the normal component of the acceleration. Also, if you happen to know, for example, it's moving in a constant speed, you know that this component of acceleration is zero. So you can glean a lot of information about acceleration based on normal and tangential components for motion in a circle. Another component system that's sometimes useful is called radial and transverse components. You won't see this one quite as often as normal and tangential, but you will see it from time to time. Radial and transverse components is useful It's useful for motion that's described in terms of polar coordinates. So if I draw Cartesian coordinate system, here's a particle moving through space, and here's its position, R. I can also describe that position in polar coordinates related to the length of R and the angle theta, like that. So this leads us to another set of components based on the polar coordinate system. So we define, again, we define two unit vectors, E sub R is the radial unit vector, and it points in the same direction as the position vector, or directly away from the origin. And then we have the transverse, we usually call that E sub theta, the transverse component 
it's perpendicular to e sub r and rotated in the positive, sorry, rotate. In a positive theta direction. So just to be clear about that, drawing those unit vectors on this, let me include perhaps a path that it's following like that. Then the radial unit vector, same direction as R, looks like that. And the transverse, I take E sub R and I rotate it 90 degrees perpendicular in the positive theta direction. So that's this direction. And that's the transverse. And again, those two are perpendicular. So now, in this component system, we can write the position vector as just the length of the position vector R times the unit vector in the radial direction. So that's how we write position in radial and transverse components. So the velocity, which is the derivative of R with respect to time, is going to be dr dt in the radial direction plus R times d e sub R dt. So this is similar to what we had the last time. Uh, dr dt that's the change in the length of the vector. We can figure that out uh, rather straightforwardly. But what's this derivative of the radial component unit vector? Well, again, as uh, the particle moves along the path, the orientation of this component system changes. So the derivative dE sub r dt is not equal to 0. But it can be shown that the time rate of change of the radial unit vector is equal to r dot times e sub r. And another relationship that's useful is the time rate of change of the transverse unit vector, also not zero. That's equal to minus theta dot e sub r. So using those two relationships, well actually just one of them, I can write the velocity in radial and transverse components as r dot e sub r plus r theta dot e sub theta. That's the representation of velocity in radial and transverse components. Remember this is polar coordinate system. So in polar coordinate system perhaps you're told about the motion in terms like r is a function of time and theta is a function of time. In which case, finding r dot theta dot is pretty straightforward. Uh, similarly, we can get the acceleration, taking the derivative of this, making use of these two relationships, as follows, a little more complex, r double dot minus r theta dot squared. All of that is the radial component of acceleration, plus r theta double dot So that's the expression of acceleration in radial and transverse components. It's not very intuitive when you look at it. However, typically when you are dealing with problems in radial and transverse components, you'll be given information about the motion in polar coordinates. For example, you're given r as some function of time and theta as some function of time. If you know both of those, then you can find the velocity by taking the derivative of finding r dot and theta dot plug in here and acceleration in a similar way.